again, I see a lot of similarities between obesity um, and, and smoking. Kind of just quickly talking about obesity and, and why it's an issue. Uh, it's related to many different diseases, heart disease, metabolic syndrome, stroke, diabetes, cancer, just to name a few of them. As far as when we're looking at the population health, you know, like say in the United States, and I think a great historical example of this was, you know, smoking. So a lot of efforts were made to educate people once it was, you know, conclusively linked that, you know, smoking was causing lung cancer and heart attacks and all these adverse health outcomes that we know of, you know, and, and it's right there on the you know, warning label today with those tobacco products. Um, could you talk a little bit about what that process looked like and then perhaps how that could apply to a, you know, a, a health disaster today or, or um, I guess a pathology that we see very commonly in the public population today, if there's an example of that? Yeah, smoking is a great example of a, a huge public health win, um, although it took a very long time and a lot of effort uh, to get. Um, it, clinicians had identified that smoking was associated with lung cancer and other health outcomes pretty early on, but it took a while to move in the direction that we have are more preventing it through these upstream things causing primary prevention. Um, but this kind of came with all three tiers of prevention kind of developing at the same time. So as we were learning that smoking was associated with, with lung cancer and heart disease and stroke and all these things, we started developing better ways of identifying it. And so kind of going back to the USPSTF, they recommend getting um, a C a low dose CT for if you've had 20 years of smoking history. So that's a way of identifying um, lung cancer early uh, in, in smokers. And they also, there's been a lot of tertiary prevention that's been developed uh, alongside that with um, uh, oncology and radiation and some of the surgeries that we have. Um, and then with enough lobbying, we were able to really move in the direction of primary prevention. So increasing taxes on cigarettes, limiting where they're sold, um, campaigns on trying to get it away from uh, children and um, not on TV and not um, during sports games and, and not kind of constantly in your face, um, as well as limiting who can get them. So making it so only people over 18 um, can get them. I think this is a good example to keep in mind because there was big in like industry incentives to keep the process going and keep selling cigarettes, um, which made it so, take so long for us to, to get to where we are now, where finally um, the the rates of cigarettes are, are dropping pretty significantly. Um, so kind of the big public health issue in my mind now is obesity. And I see a lot of similarities between obesity um, and, and smoking. Kind of just quickly talking about obesity and, and why it's an issue. Uh, it's related to many different diseases, heart disease, metabolic syndrome, stroke, diabetes, cancer, just to name a few of them. And the prevalence, which is all the people that are diagnosed with obesity has increased pretty dramatically in uh, the very recent years um, from 30% to 40%, just from 1999 to, to now. So now four out of 10 adults um, in the United States are obese, um, which is concerning and it's increasing. We also see increasing rates of obesity with children, um, which is which is disturbing. This is associated with high healthcare costs, which drives all healthcare costs up, um, as well as a high cost for individuals. I think it's it's like fifteen hundred dollars a year um, extra for people who are obese that they end up spending in, in healthcare costs. So uh, it certainly affects people, and it doesn't affect all people the same either. Uh, lower socioeconomic status. Um, People, people with lower education and, and certain racial groups have higher prevalence of obesity. Um, so it's unequally distributed amongst our population too. So it's a, a very serious issue. Um, and there's industrial forces that uh, incentivize increasing selling um, unhealthy foods to people and not a lot of incentive to, to decrease the cost of obesity, decrease the amount of obesity. I think part of this is the treatment, the best treatment for obesity is a mix of a good diet, exercise, and really good counseling from a multidisciplinary team. But that is, um, 
it's kind of hard to make money on those things. It's not a surgery or a procedure that you can do. It's not a, a medication that you can drive up costs and sell a bunch of. Um, there certainly are uh, bariatric surgeries and some some really good medications for weight loss, um, but those can't just be done on themselves. They need to be done in conjunction uh, with diet, with exercise, and really good counseling. And, and that really is the base. And there's no financial incentive um, for that. If anything, the healthcare system is structured in a way that it incentivizes more people to become obese because you can bill for those encounters. So I don't think there's like malicious doctors who who want people to be obese um, or want increased volume. I've never never heard that in my life. If anything, I want I hear a lot of doctors wanting decreased volume. But the way the system is structured, it's structured in a way that the the hospital makes money every single time someone comes into it. So there's no financial incentive to decrease the amount of obesity. Um, and so a lot of the effort gets put into managing late stage diabetes or strokes or congestive heart failure. Um, and we're really good at that in the United States. That's where all the research goes. And that's where at UCLA, most of my work is figuring out how to optimize those kind of things because we can make money on those. But we're not focused on preventing the obesity from even happening in the first place. So I think there's it's kind of twofold here. One is we need... Um, financial incentives to decrease it, but then also there's these outside forces that want to keep selling junk food, high sugary foods to um, our population that is kind of preventing us from moving in that direction. So I think it's a mix of kind of restructuring our healthcare systems um, and really lobbying against these, these companies. Yeah, and you, that's a very good overview of how you can take kind of the situation of smoking and some of the measures that were taken there from a public health standpoint, and then applying those to the current situation with individuals overweight and obese. And, you know, even as staggering as some of those figures are, you know, 40% obese, 70% overweight, it's a bit of a lagging indicator because we have people that are trending in that direction. So, you know, 10 years from now, I wouldn't be surprised to see those continue to increase all things remaining equal. Um, and then another piece of that, I think um, you, you mentioned to the environment, the companies, the drivers of this, that obesogenic environment. And when you take these, you know, cultures that are historically thin, you know, with normal BMI, and they don't have these diseases of, you know, calorie excess, um, and then they are, you know, transplanted or, or they immigrate to the United States, you see over generations, the same, you know, stereotypical Western diseases start to develop in these traditional healthy populations. So to me, that means that the you know, obesogenic environment, as we tend to call it in you know, obesity medicine, is um, a big driver of this. Yes, I would absolutely agree. Um, I think there's probably some genetic component, but I think a lot of it is environment, as you mentioned. Um, and, that, and that's a great example of how it is.